Welcome to the Toast Talks podcast, where we sit down with some of the most interesting entrepreneurs and self-made business leaders in the Northwest to learn their past to success, the challenges they faced, how they dealt with these, and what the future holds for their com- companies and the Northwest more broadly. Today's guest is none other than Gareth McGlynn, who most of you will know from his days at Derry City. We talk about growing up in Donegal, his early days in TriStar, and then later years playing for Derry City. We talk about how football taught him how to deal with the ups and downs of running your own business and how you went from a footballer and electrical engineering graduate to a specialist recruiter in the United States. As some of you may not know, Gareth is co-founder, along with his wife Kira McGlynn, a former Derry City Leaders footballer herself, of Niche SSP, a company with offices in the Northwest providing great, great opportunities for local talent. So without further ado, let's get started. So Gareth... Welcome to the Toast Talks podcast. Great to have you. Yeah, nice to be here. So uh, looking forward to this one. I've uh, hassled you for quite a while, so uh, glad to find that you finally broke. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Obviously, uh, from in the northwest, most people would know you from from Derry City originally. Um, um, Maybe a few more recently from from Niche SSP, your co-founder and uh, MD of that. Um, But I think we'll 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 start maybe back back a bit. So you grew up in, in Donegal, in Chileland, small, small island. Rural area. <laughs> Very Not how much happens. But uh, always an outdoorsy, never really a computer game sort of person. Ah, uh, well, you know what? It's eleven and nine was you were rural, you're growing up on a farm, like bar farming, there wasn't much else happening. I mean there's no shop, there's no bars, there's no hotels, no restaurants an inch. Um and a lot of people, believe it or not, the amount of dairy people or people from further afield that have never been on Ninja, have never heard of it. Um, and actually, you know the walk now? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. kind of bringing a few people out there now to do the walk. But before that, like, they, nobody was aware of it. Um, and it's just, well, be five, 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 fifty houses on in, Ninja. In that's it. And I'm in the way back in the, in the back end. So right. to get to the main road, it's, it's a good, it's a good five minute drive. Mm. no. So, you know, you, you had to had to learn to entertain yourself and that was not all for you. You had, to, you had to learn to walk, to cycle and to run, to get the, even to get the bus in the morning. We, we had a, it only came on the inch so far and then we had to walk to the, the bus. Like, so it was just, you, you had to learn to, if you want to do anything or go anywhere, you had to travel first yourself. So walk and run and cycle and Fair, fair independence comes from that. Well, that's at that, hundred percent. And you had it. Otherwise, you wouldn't have got. Because I mean, your your mother and father are only going to do so much taxing. You know. What I mean? Ah, listen. Uh, well, know, but sure, you can't was, relate, You know, you rely on them so much. Uh, but, you know, there's a line. And there's so a if you had to be out the road at three o'clock and there was somebody leaving at half eleven, you had to go at half eleven and hang about and go to a mate's house or something like that. And yeah, 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 so it was yeah. a little, little bit of planning. Uh, a little bit of, and it's not, it's not like it was. You know, back in our day, it was. Uh, you know, that was you had to stick the layer timetable. Now. Parents seem to you know, fare their kids about. Maybe we didn't get that nah, the advantages of that. Too pampered now, aren't they? Too pampered. <laughs> too pampered. But um, you started in, in TriStar originally, so uh, with Clifford, John Clifford, and uh, Big Og, yeah, started there. And uh, so really, from inch, there was nothing there like that. So you had to come in the day, I suppose, for for stuff. There like was that. an issue in league, like underage and stuff like that. Um, played with the school, so the school gave you a bit of exposure. Um, you were able to then qualify for the schoolboys Ireland yeah. um, teams through Ulster, and then through obviously the the they pick a team from the provinces, and then you go away and travel. And I got a cap through that late on, but bef- when it was about twelve, thirteen. You had the NHL and league, um, but it was a weird setup because there wasn't much happening, and Alia wouldn't have been as established at that stage. Right, yeah, yeah. And my mum taught in St. Bridget's in Cairn Hill, so she was speaking to a few of the teachers, and you know, the way they talk, oh, the, the setup's much better, and all that. And yeah, she says, yeah, yeah. bring him and they try star, by Google, look after him. Um, so that's what she did. She was going on there anyway. Uh, now, that was at the start, and then we started playing games and all, and there was a lot of f- taxiing. But so she got me in there um, through a friend of hers. Uh, of course, the Donegal ones, and they were all, look at that <laughs> snob, better <laughs> going on the dairy. Why doesn't he stay, stay and play here? Um, but it was a good experience because I'd have been wet behind the ears, like at that age, 12. Okay. Uh, 
just not not privy to a lot of the, the badness going on in the world in the back end you don't hear about much happening no, I, so get in there I, I, oh my god I didn't I didn't speak for for 12 months but Og was perfect because he did not care where are you from what your background was how good you were how good, bad you were he ta- taught everybody or he treated everyone the same and yeah. it was absolutely brilliant it was it was just one of those fortunate things that I, I landed on the, the mentorship of Og quite early on which helped me long term and to be fair I mean I have a bit of experience with, with TriStar nowadays and that tradition seems to have continued so it's, it's great to see that you know uh, that, that, that facility is there for, for young people now going up so think of how many people have benefited from that kind of you know outlet or experience or you know whatever because sport is good which we'll, we'll come to is it, it can actually do more than what you actually just think it's just, for some people it's just playing football but you actually learn quite a bit more from it but um so you started you started training with TriStar uh what age did you kind of start getting where you you know scouted or or you know said it that did, did they did they know you were decent at that stage well even even Tubin uh, Manus O'Donnell who would have been a big GA man was the Irish teacher in the, in the primary school um, obviously he played everything he played handball hurley Gaelic football um, and then whatever else was going um, but I, I played everything I played everything right up till I was about 15 15 and a half and I loved playing everything but if push come to shove and then obviously at 15 you've got a Derry City are looking to give you a contract and you've got to go, well, they're not going to let you play Gaelic and Hurley at the same time. Yeah, so you've got to make a decision. But um, no, I played everything. It was it was now, my, if there was a game in the secondary school and there was a Hurley game that uh, clashed with the football team, would happen rarely, I would go to the football game. Like Right, right. Yeah. So it was, it was a priority kind of early on? You, you, you favoured it? I did, I, I, I did. Although I really did like Hurley. Um, Gaelic, I could, I could, unbelievable for fitness wise it was incredible but Hurley there was a lot more technical skill involved I really liked that aye, aye. but you see but from, from that if you're playing hurling and Gaelic and stuff like that and then you know you come to play football the physical aspect of it you know made probably lended itself to your football then, or it improved your football sorry for and because I'm 5 foot 8 like I need, I need to harden up or, or drink a pint of cement you know what I mean <laughs> So the hurling and the gay, like, like you have to, it's rough, like it, it's Aye. rough. Um, you need to be able to put your head on where, where, where it hurts, like, totally, and that, totally and that helped me. Yeah, because I think if I hadn't done that, I think I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have developed as quick, especially at 16, 17, like 16, 17, making your debut at 16 uh, and seniors men in the League of Ireland. I don't think if I hadn't have played hurling or gay, like, I probably would have been a wee bit Too. fragile, a wee bit timid. Yeah. Uh, and, and I was a bit scared licking under these big men. Uh, I'll never forget the, the St. Pat's team that, that turned up one one day and they were just like men, man, men mountain. The whole <laughs> lot of them were all like 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and built like shit houses and, ago. And, and you 17? Oh, my God. And like, I'm scrawny now. You wanted to see me back in. I was like a 10-year-old boy. Whoppet. Oh. But so... T- talk me through that. So you're, you're you're when did you say sixteen, seventeen? You signed your first contract. Yeah. What's that like? As you know, you're you're sixteen, seventeen. You're quite kind of you know you're still quite young, quite naive, like you're saying. And then all of a sudden you, you're signing for a pr- pretty professional club. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you keep yourself grounded whenever? They come around and you're, you're kind of going, Jesus, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to be a professional footballer here. I was, they're saying that, and then there's like, at, at, even at that level, like, um, it, it was, it was, I, I never thought that, but your, your parents obviously keep you right. Like, it was always education, education, education. Like, I wasn't very good at school, but they ensured that I got the education along with the football, which was, I was blessed. There was a good university and, 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 and Derry and a, a good football team. I was blessed to have, to be able to uh, take advantage of both, but. Whenever I was coming through there, it happened quite quickly. I was playing for the reserves. Believe it or not, I was playing for the reserves against Trojans in a cup final in the Brandywell, and we got battered 6-1. <laughs> Absolutely. But it could have been 10 or 12. Uh, but the, the scout at the time, Oxford McLaughlin, he was Derry City Reserve Manager's, unbelievable. Um, just one of those. But very, very similar to Stephen Kenny, was able to pick out, um, and he's proven that year in, year out. Like some of the players that came through Derry, he was able to pick them out. I mean, how do you pick out a player in the opposition team that gets bothered 6-1? And he picked out three from our team, me, Chris and, and Liam. And we went down training and, and we, we, we trained the trade, playing in the Ulster Senior League. Um, then Oxo 
I was coming to that stage where I was I was playing centre midfield, I was playing all the time, and Kevin Mahan came down to watch a game. Uh, and it's mad the way you can I can I can pick out the game. He only came down for half an hour, but I remember what happened in the half an hour and the couple of things that I did. That I thought, geez, I, that, that this will give me a chance. Yeah. Um. I literally picked me out. I went training for a week, and then I made my debut. Uh. In the in the in the cup game against Limerick. Um. So it all happened quickly. So like th- sitting back and thinking, oh, I've made it now in a professional contract. I can't remember I was getting like. 40 quid a game or something like that yeah, like yeah, it was yeah. it was that never never bothered me but um I, it wasn't I, about that it wasn't about that but I, I never had time to sit down and go yeah, Jesus yeah. this, this is class like, but you suppose you still at school at that stage right? oh I was still yeah. at, at Tubin, like I was still going back and doing me or not Tubin, sorry a convent in Bunkrana uh-huh. still going back and doing me at that stage it would have been the fourth year yeah, yeah. preparing for my leaving cert yeah, yeah. And that, so how, how did you balance that sort of stuff at that stage was it just you know listen to your parents kind of installing and going listen, listen school comes first and, and oh, you need your you need to finish your education and then well even, is second. even back then I was doing deals with my, my, my parents it was like <laughs> they says you're going to not go like I was all that don't need to go to <laughs> like every other kid don't need to go to school now I'm going to play football <laughs> the rest of my life this is me this is me sorted 40 quid a week that'll take me that'll take me far I'm rich uh, uh, so I, I, they says listen you can do whatever you want with football but you're going to get a degree once you get that degree so graduate in 2006 you can do whatever you want like yeah, yeah. Th- then the, the shackles are off but until that happens um, and I mean the leaving cert we're talking about I uh, was actually talking about it in work here today I had to repeat the leaving cert like I was not good at school um, I had to work hard I was uh, but that's you know there's different kinds of smart and that's the that, that, that's the thing some people are very strong academically and then there's others who can have a bit more common sense let's say so it's not you know it doesn't always ne- necessarily mean anything um, but so you think that from your parents' side, good advice to keep to continue on with your education. You know, you always had something to fall back on, which well, we'll, again we'll come to. But. Well, hindsight's a perfect thing because through you, we'll, we'll find out later on. If I didn't have the degree, I wouldn't have got on to Australia. I wouldn't have got my visa. Like that part, of, and if that that part of my life doesn't happen, then each doesn't happen. So yeah, yeah. So it's it's like it's thinking long term, and it, it, that kind of taught me quite a lot in, in relation to doing things now that will affect you in 10 years like doing doing the right thing and re- making the right decisions um, and I'm a firm believer of, like you're you're a, you're a product of your decisions like we're all given pretty much the, the same opportunity just on that you know the product that you, there's a lot that goes into like say a person as a as a product afterwards you know you, you pick things up as you go along and um, you know not what you, what you start out as is not what you end up as so Throughout the years, you actually had the opportunity to play with, like the likes of Liam Coyle, uh, uh, Paddy McCourt, uh, you know Ryan McBride, and, and, and later years and Mark Farn and people like that. But you were also then you'd uh, gone, you know, there was quite a few managers and things like that. So you mentioned Stephen Kenny. Is there any particular? One that you you kind of remember, and you know, were were quite an influence in your life. So, that, like the likes of Og, as I suppose, you know, was quite a good influence at the start. But then, as you were with Derry Saturday and things like that, that that actually gave you advice, and you were kind of going, do you know, what? that's that's actually stayed with me throughout the years. A few, everyone kind of touched a, a little bit. Obviously, you, you kind of remember the good times. You don't you don't remember the the bad times as much, or well, the the real bad times you do remember. They stick out as a competitive person. You're always going to remember the yeah. bad times because that, that's what drives you. But um, I mean, Stephen would have been uh, Stephen would have been my manager for probably the longest. Yep. Um, <laughs> we weren't good. There was managers getting sacked left, right, and center at st- at most of the stages. Um, but no, he would have had a big influence. But Og especially. Even going back to Mr. Doherty uh, in Tubin, so I would have been really young, I would have had um, just issues, behavioural issues, and, and just doing the wrong things, just constantly on the football pitch and just not treating people well. And uh, that would have sta- stayed with me the whole way through. That was a big lesson for me um, in discipline. Um, now, obviously, my parents would have installed that as well, but he kind of reaffirmed what they were telling me because sometimes you don't listen to your parents no. because they're close to you, but you would, you, you, you would probably pick out influence outside more so. You would have listened to them more so than, than your parents. But So he definitely would have had, then you'd Og, then you'd Oxo. Um, Oxo would have, would have uh, given me a lot of confidence and just, like, just... L- l- freedom to go and play you know what I mean whereas I would have been quite regimental right I've got to do this then and this is what I do when I get the ball here yeah, yeah. he would have been showing me quite like there's a lot there's a lot of um, 
the spontaneous stuff that you need to be doing as well yeah, yeah, outside yeah. of your where they, where they be and how they play um, and then Stephen would have been uh, quite good as well because obviously through the successful times and through the ups and downs of, of Derry then from 2004 to think 2008 so yeah. it would have been they would all have given me a little bit you know uh, you gather about some pieces as mm-hmm. you go along um, obviously you, you touched on it there there's some obviously amazing times where the likes of the European nights were Paris and Gothenburg and Gretna and, and places like that. Um, so really, really big highs, seven trophies across your career. Is that, that right? That's right, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And then, but there's also then the disappointment. So like you're saying, you know, you, you have to learn to, to deal with the, the ups and the downs. Uh, like the likes of 2006, missing out in the treble. How, how do you how do you how do you bring yourself back from that? Um, how do you bring yourself? Well, first of all, you got to look at at the opposition, the person, the, the the team that took it away from me, and the Cork City team. There was massive admiration and how good they were. Um, it was built basically by Pat Dolan. Damien Richardson was the manager at the time, but he was just steering the ship like they were quality. They were probably they're probably still considered one of the best teams in the in the in, in my era anyway. Um, so you you got to step back and go, you know what? The better team probably won. Now going down there and only needing a draw in front of fourteen thousand people, it was difficult to take at the time. Like we we were that good, and Stephen had instilled that much confidence that we thought we were going down there to do a job. Um, listen, it didn't work out, but you, you just take you t- take your take your hat off to them. That was a big one. Um, the other one we lost it in goal difference, uh, the league, and then at Bowes in two thousand and ten we lost it in basically the second last day. Um, it was it was tough, but it's amazing. You, you mentioned seven trophies. I probably don't remember the seven trophies as much as I remember how clear and what happened and, and the disappointments. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. and there was some tough. The the the, the big the, the tough years was when you had nothing to play for. When you were sitting mid table, you had no relegation to, to battle or you had no European spots to fight. They were just going through the motions. That's that's tough as a player. Yeah, yeah. It really is. Um, even the playoff against Van Harps, where Liam scored the goal, that was that was a good year. Like we were battling, we were fighting all the time. It was it was proper team being galvanised and, and, and fighting for uh, and then beating Harps as well was a had a bonus. Do you see, like if you're a naturally competitive person, I suppose you want to be in those D- those games yeah, and, yeah. and that, as you say, you know, for your, your mad table and you're kind of just drifting. No. It's not what you're. It's not what you're there no. for. You're there for the, the the competitiveness. So those ups and downs, right? So we'll we'll come on to niche, but um, do you think they've they have helped you in in your later life? So obviously you started your own business. <laughs> there's good days. There's bad days. <laughs> there's some really <laughs> bad <laughs> days. <laughs> so do you think that has uh, allowed you to deal with the, the, the ups and downs of business a bit, a bit better than maybe uh, than you would have if you, if you didn't have that oh, 100% experience. Uh, it shapes you every way I mean you think about the people that we employ here there's going to be ups and downs because they're essentially run their own business within our brand you know what I mean so I look in their CVs all the time did they play sports were they competitive have they travelled have they experienced different cultures what is their background have they stayed within their their, their their qualification have they veered out have they experienced different things you you, you look at everything um, it's not just I mean this idea of of bringing someone on I mean we, we hire people they don't have to have an education don't have to yeah. have a degree we hire people on life experiences and, and that's the only way that, that you can go and I'm, a, I'm, I'm a, a product of that like the ups and downs of things that I've experienced it's been all it hasn't been all good, but it's been all good in the fact that I've used it to me, to my advantage because people can use experiences and, and it can literally just derail them. Yeah. But if you take it in the chin, you learn from it and you move on, then you, you've got a hell of a chance. And that thing that you're saying about, you know, uh, you know, it, it, the educational background maybe isn't as important as, as the life experience. It, it is actually, you know, you can get somebody who has degrees coming out their ears yeah. and then you sit sit down with them and you kind of you talk to them for 10 or 15 minutes and you kind of go this guy hasn't a clue yeah. like I mean you know <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you, you, you kind of go how, how did and you know so I, I completely I, understand what you, you I, I blame the education system I mean people are now taught degrees and even in schools it's, it's, it's not taught properly they're sitting there and the teacher is just telling them what they think instead of all the, all the way about the, the degrees aren't they're not telling them how to think and how to problem solve and I got you can only problem solve when you put yourself in certain scenarios yep. that you don't know, know the answers to and you, you find the answer you're yep. not told how to get yourself out of there yeah. and traveling um, working in different industries with different people and different backgrounds and you pick that up I mean they say you're a, you're a product of the four or five 
most people that influence you, I would agree with that as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a company you keep, you know. And, and you're right, though, it is, you know, people's ability to problem solve and kind of look at something and go, right, well, if I do it this way, then that will happen. And if I do it this way, then that will happen. And to a certain extent, some of it is not something you can teach. It is life experience and kind of practice and, and being in certain situations. So do you think sport, uh, your involvement in sport has has assisted you in that way from from the company from running a business perspective you know the discipline that's required the the life experience that dealing with the ups and downs and um you know kind of having to be independent i suppose and think for yourself and kind of go right i need to make a decision here uh, uh, do you think your sport uh, has background has helped that 100 percent. i mean the, the the competitiveness within seals is a is a big thing. Um, any seals department in the world, and not only that, but I think traveling was a big thing as well. Like New York taught me a lot of things. I went to New York. I wasn't the greatest at recruitment when I was early on. Uh, like my, my wife Kira would have been a high performer in her in her uh, her field and, and her company. But when I went to New York, I was going. Oh, we're going to New York here. Like there's going to be no dummies in New York. Like it's it is New York. Um, but you get there, and I think it's an Irish thing as well. We we take ourselves for granted. Like if you if if you give uh, an Irish person a, a Nobel Prize, they'll probably go. Ah, it was just it was just helping a few people out. Like you know what I mean? <laughs> wasn't it wasn't me? Whereas if you give an American a Nobel Prize, they will shout from the rooftops about it, and they will overpromise and over. So in, in that respect, New York taught me a lot. Um, it taught me within my field, and football did the same. Um, when we went to play Paris and Gothenburg and all that, it's like, oh, jeez, we're going to we're going to Paris Saint Germain here. There's going to be twenty six thousand people sitting shouting Paris Saint Germain on. We're going to get battered. But actually, when you go there and you play eleven v eleven, one ball, two goals. There's 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 small there's small differences. Um, no, they turned us over into over two legs, two 0 in, in Paris, nil nil in, in the Brandywell, but. Like there's nothing to be afraid of. Like, and, and it's it's the confidence thing that I think Irish people need to get more at. They don't know how good they are when they go internationally, and how well they travel, and how well they're they're received as well. Yeah, I was just going to say that. That's exactly you know, you don't actually realise what you can achieve. Uh, you know, you, you give it a good go, you, you go on confident, kind of go. Listen, you know, it's the thing. Any given any given Sunday, I suppose, is the the NFL saying of it, but. Uh, you know, you go into a football match and the AFA Cup's probably a good example of it. You know, you get lower down teams who on, on the day can mm. just mm. outperform as a team and, yeah. and turn over uh, another team. But the, the the big thing I would say as well, even the North West, like in the North West Ireland, they're like, we're, we're quite suppressed. I mean, when it comes to opportunity, infrastructure, like it's a disgrace. It's, it's a cultural DNA thing that, that's been instilled in us for generations. We, we need to get out of that and get out of that quick because if we're looking to compete even within the, the country of Ireland, then yep. it need, attitudes need to change. And that was one of the biggest reasons for starting Niche. In 2011, when I was leaving for Perth, there was not enough high-income jobs. Um, yep. So people opportunities for people to sit down, do an international job from here, and earn good money that it will increase their lifestyle. Um, so that was one of the biggest benefits and what, one of the things that we wanted to bring back to the North West. But just, just on that, so... Uh, Covid has brought a lot of bad things. Uh, obviously, there's it's not been not been great, and and a, a whole number of different aspects, but it does seem to have driven uh, innovation and kind of entrepreneurship and and things like that. So, um, do you think the northwest is changing now? Where you know people are actually starting to think, you know, actually. You know we can do this, and and we can. There there seems to have been so many companies uh, brought back. You know maybe pre COVID, just but it was starting pre COVID. But uh, from that, where you know people are actually sitting down and going, do you know what? I can give this a go and and compete with. You know you're you're competing in an, an American market. Uh, you know there's nothing really to stop. No. Business is doing that and, that, and that's I think what. what but I mean, are... if I hadn't gone away and travelled and experienced recruitment, and see different cultures and see different businesses, I would never have been able to. St- I wasn't going to st- stand up in two thousand eleven, going, "I'm going to start a recruitment company." Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know the first thing about recruitment. Um, so that you've got to open yourself up to stuff like that the for that to happen, the innovation to happen. But I agree with you. COVID, it's a recession, pandemic. I mean, that's when the best opportunities and and the best time to start businesses is. Um, well, just on that, right? So we, we kind of touched on it a bit. So you did, you did get your degree. Uh, so whilst you were playing football, you were you were actually studying at the same time. Uh, but it was an electrical engineering. 
So um, you then so the, you then finished with with Derry City, and you said like you said you travelled, so it was Perth first. How does a guy who is a professional footballer uh, with a degree in electrical engineering end up in recruitment? Mm. Talk us through that. <laughs> well, it's like every person that you know in recruitment, they fall into it. Nobody wakes up in the morning or comes out of a, a primary school or secondary school and goes, Daddy, I want to be a recruiter. <laughs> like, I didn't know it existed. I knew it existed at, 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 at temp level and small level, but the, the, the closest I would have came to recruitment would have been working with agents uh, within right. football and similar. But at that stage, I, I, could, I didn't connect the dots. Like, when we went to Australia, understanding how the game worked... Um, they're basically playing on the, the lack of resources that every industry and every business. I mean, you you talk about any business in the Northwest, although people say, geez, there's not a lot of opportunities around here. Everybody is recruiting. Everybody yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's just it's it's a it's a demand, it's it's a game supply and demand, and it's only gonna get worse. Um but I mean electrical engineering wasn't for me. That that was a means to an end. Like I literally I didn't even know what I wanted to do. Um, I, I just knew I didn't want, well, I wanted to play football, but I just needed to get this degree. So, and I probably picked the wrong degree. It was bloody most difficult. I should have went and done like geography or uh, English or teaching or something like that. Um, or accountancy, something easy. Uh, <laughs> I know. But no, and, and then to be honest with you, it was, it was year four within the placement year that I just turned around and went, this is not me. Yep. Sitting coding up in Dublin for for Filenet, who was bought by ABM. Like I, I just knew this wasn't this wasn't for me. But you finished it out. Oh, I had it, uh, uh, and was that that was part of the deal. <laughs> <laughs> that was part of it. So your your parents, but also I suppose in football, you kind of don't ever you're taught really never to give up as well. Yeah, you know. So yeah. you're 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 three nil down. Uh, There's you know five minutes left on the clock. Realistically you're probably never going to get that back. But, you know, yeah, it's mentality happened. is, the, it's happened. Istanbul, and that's, you keep yeah. going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Um, but no, grit and resilience, I mean, that's something we, we always ask for here. Like, in people's, it's hard to see it in resumes. you got to, yeah. again, you got to talk to people and, and, and see. People crazy, we, I put an ad up and they, 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 they uh, apply. I speak to everyone that applies. Most people, I can just bring them in and, and see what they're all about. And that's what you're looking for. Ah, exactly. You're not yeah. looking for a, a degree or a, somebody being in one company for 10 years. The chances are they've they're, they've learned a lot of bad habits in those 10 years with yeah. the same company. They haven't experienced too much else. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then, so from, from Australia, uh, so from Perth, you, you decided to move on to New York, like you were, like you were saying. Um, so lived in Manhattan for how long? Two years. Two years. Yeah. And that's, so... Uh, you, you, at that stage, is that where niche kind of... The, the idea started going or, or what was it that you you know did you always want to start your own business or or did you just kind of go oh, listen I've had enough of working in the in the corporate system uh for for too long so I think I could give it a shot myself uh, the corporate system was never for me um even in too many rules even in Perth yeah too much red tape <laughs> I'm not a I'm not I'm, I'm the worst student in the world um but uh, it was kind of out of uh, obviously we, we we myself and Kira started a family then around then so that was always never going to work. Were we going to bring up a child in New York? Probably not. Uh, I could barely look after myself in New York. Never mind a child. Yeah. And that 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 kind of before that six months before that when Kira fell pregnant, I had always an idea that 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 we was going to do that. I started a business in two thousand and nine just while I was playing football for Derry, just to test the water and see what it was like. How an events company did casino nights taught me a lot, um, and I think. Every, every entrepreneur will tell you that. You've got to start someone feel, start someone feel. Yep, yep. So I couldn't really afford this one to feel, um, and that, that casino night feel, feel, feel as well eventually, but um, I couldn't afford this one because I now had, myself and Kira had ourselves to look after, but now we've got a, a dependent coming. So um, I had done enough research and saw enough in Australia, in Perth, in, or sorry, in Perth, Australia, and New York to be able to know exactly what market to go after, how did to go about it? But it took a lot of asking questions and, and getting mentors and non-executive directors on board to advise me as well. I was lucky. Yep. I was lucky to have a, a decent support network of people that I could bounce on. And I had that that office in Perth when I first landed there. There was fifty five people in the office. Um, it. And we kind of had a recession, so it was a bad time to have recruitment. Went down to about thirty three. I survived, and out of those thirty three, like 
fifty percent of them all went and started their own businesses. Right. So I would just, 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 just talk, ask questions, man. talk, talk, and people don't do that enough. Um, even best way to learn. Oh my god! Even people come in here now work for me. I say you gotta ask questions. If you don't ask the question, you will not get it. Listen, I walked around business in Derry and knocked on the door, and the people not even know me, and I've asked them questions that yep. that they're probably a wee bit uncomfortable answering. But it's the only way you like you you can go and research it for two years. Yeah. And get to the answer, or you can go down the street in ten minutes and ask the, the expert within that. Somebody who'll know it straight off. And that's what Just, I do. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And it's about it's about my strengths and weaknesses. I know what my strengths are, my weaknesses are, and I just ask me me, me weaknesses those those specific points. I ask people about them. Just like you were saying there, so you couldn't really afford niche to fail, so your back was essentially against the wall from from that. Do you think? That's, uh, you know, say with the, with the with the events company, we're kind of sort of half on half out. Do you think it's it's much better that you're you're kind of all in with with uh, no know, safety net, no safety net, no plan just, B. Yeah, you have to make this work, and and you you do whatever it takes to make it work. And part of that was the, the decision very early on to me and Kira um, was does one of us go and work? and one of us start the business and see how it goes and then the other person can transition into the business or do we just go for it? Um, and it needed the two of us, you know what I mean? There was, it, it, it needed you be, you be stronger. Um, and, and for the, the market that we wanted to go after and how quickly we needed to be up to, up to speed, uh, we were lucky as well. It was a good market, a good time in the US. Like it was year-on-year -year growth, e economic. There was loads of fiscal spending and, and construction. So it was, I'm not say it was... I don't believe in luck, but it was good timing. Uh, so the thing, else. the harder you work, the luckier you get. Yeah, hundred percent. But no, it, it needed the two of us. Like she was going to get to do it, and she, she was risk adverse, and I was like, "No, we're, we're going for this. <laughs> like, let let's go." And, and she was going, "Well, I'll go and get a job." And I was like, oh, "No, good, nice. good balance, lad. Good risk balance." Uh, uh, oh, you need it, uh, rain, yeah. uh, but no doubt about it. If um, and even throughout the history of the company, like Kira would have been quite, oh, don't let's let's not do that. Let's not hire three or four new people. Let's just consolidate and Keep we've got a, we've got a nice wee lifestyle business. We're earning half decent money, and I was all no. I, I don't want to build it to sell, but I want to build it to to. to and again, it's about uh, offering opportunity to people. You know what I mean? It comes back to the reason that we started the business and and part of the the, the plan. Um, so we we want to give as as many people the opportunity as possible. But that that's kind of the I suppose the whole point of. Uh, the Toast Talks podcast is to highlight the kind of businesses that you know everybody like you were saying you know the, the, the opportunities whenever I suppose you were growing up what weren't weren't great you know a lot of people maybe had to to go to Belfast or or to uh, you know maybe who were to England or you you had to go to Australia um, but to take, actually demonstrate that in the north there are opportunities to do things if you if you kind of have the the bravery, I suppose, to, to actually go into it. So for the likes of you, you've taken what you've what you've learned in the sports arena, you've you've finished your degree and, and things like that, and then used your life experience to to actually set up an opportunity in in the northwest, which is working out very well for you. Um, but in turn, what you get to do is offer that opportunity to other people, like you were saying before. They're their own, their own business. They can make out of it what they will. They put the effort on and they put the determination. The they'll do, they'll do pretty well. Uh, we're set up quite differently in the fact that usually you hire employees who support you, but we're different. Me and Kira support the employees. So yeah. They, we we actually report on them and we say, listen, how are you getting on? What sort of training development? What what do you need? How from can us? we help? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. so we do we do it that way. They don't support us. We support them. So it's um. It's working well. I it's um it's it's working well, and we're 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 looking at probably ten years of 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 growth now, looking at the economy in the US. So thank God it's going well. Yeah. Oh, that's that's good. And then, so from from the northwest, uh, more generally, uh, do you think things are changing? Do you think it's on the up? Do you think things are are looking better than they were? Maybe. Say, oh, no doubt about it. Like any any like rural place or like place that's kind of away from a city is is going to benefit from remote working. I mean, I don't believe fundamentally that remote working is good for anyone. Um, now I'm talking about not talking about remote working. I'm talking about sitting in a in a, in a bedroom in a house working 95 Monday to Friday. There is flexibility and there's regionalizing your your workforce and and, and all of that, and that will work work. Um, but. To, 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 to have a hundred percent uh remote I, I, we don't do it we do flexible flexibility um and 
I just think it worked quite well. Um, it gives people flexible to do, do the things that they, they normally wouldn't get to do. So you mean people need the interaction in some form? 100%. They, they you, you know, you very much believe, like I suppose you're, you're a sales-driven industry, so it's all about talking to people, it's all about relationships, it's all about connections. Um, and then, you know, but with that, you, you, you want the flexibility that comes with that. So if you're doing yeah. well, you know, you can... You know, it, it enables you to do more things with your family and things like that. Exactly. So it, uh, you know. And you need to be in the war room. I always call it. You need to be sitting there. We have a, we have a meeting every day at ten o'clock, and you need to be bouncing ideas off each other because you can't do that if you have to try and set up a Skype and find find, find half an hour on some schedule. Before you know it, that that actual opportunity. By the time you get the call, the opportunity has lapsed. We need to be able to talk about candidates, where they're relocating to, how we can help them, what companies are hiring. Um, it's it's fast paced, and and you need you need that. You need that quick, instant information and, and decision making. And just just on that, so uh, you, you've touched on, on something there. H- how closely would you watch the the figures, like the performance? Say, so you said there you have a you have a meeting every day. So is that something that you think is is important to to the company that everybody knows where they're at as regards candidates, numbers, pipeline? all that sort of thing? Well, pi- pipeline is for forecasting and cash flow for the business. Um, but in relation to KPIs, we're not KPA driven. Um, I've got a CRM system there that that, that keeps me up to date. Um, it's one of the most modern recruitment CRMs or softwares that you can you can get. It's great. Do I look at it? And uh, my, staff, my staff will be laughing now because I don't look at it. When I have monthly appraisals or monthly reviews, it's about asking those three questions. How can I develop you? What do you need in training? And what support do you need? Um, but but say say for instance for for uh, the the financials you would you would have a fair idea of where things are at because you have those daily meetings every day you would have a fair idea of of what's going on um, and so you really you do know the KPIs within your head but it it comes from talking to the person as opposed to kind of look, oh, yeah. looking at a at a graph kind of going. Right. Okay. Uh, you didn't make enough calls that day. Yeah, yeah. Like that, 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 and it, you know what it comes down to? It comes down to the way I was managed in Perth. I said, yeah, I didn't do very well. My first two years in, cre- in recruitment, I was KPI'd. It was managed poorly. Um, the guy just didn't understand my personality. Um, didn't work out well for him. And then went to went to New York, and I was managed by a, a woman on, on Hayes, and she was just brilliant. She's what do you need, Gareth? Never bothered me. Never asked me any questions. Came in a few client meetings. Did a bit of business with me. And that was that she was unbelievable. Results driven as opposed to just results. What have you got? End of the week, how much did you make? I made that. And and the the the, the results were chalk and cheese. I mean, New York I was I, I was flying it at the end, you know. Um and that's the way and that comes from me. That's how I manage. Yeah, and, yeah. and I only hire people that are driven like that. We get them to do an assessment, a Hogan's assessment before they come on board. And I rely on my gut quite a lot but I, I, I leverage that information as well quite heavily yeah, yeah. no it, it's definitely a good way to do it and um, you know I, I suppose it, it's really for assistance you know so say if an entrepreneur was somebody was uh, interested in setting up a business now um, what would be your advice to to them uh, as regards go for it just go for it and, and, and if this one doesn't work out you will pivot at some stage during that process whether it's a product a service it doesn't really matter, um, manufacture something, you will pivot at some stage and you will learn so much that even you now, I say go for it and then there'll be loads of people come back to me going, you told me to go for it, now I'm broke. <laughs> so there is a risk involved, we all know that. Yeah, and to yeah, be honest yeah. with you, once you go out on your own, to try and get back in the, in, into the corporate world, um, it's frowned upon, like they look at you and go, oh Jesus, that boy's just, he wants to come back and get a few quid together to go again. Um, but no, go for it. Go for it, learn, learn loads. Ask, ask questions. questions. Get experts in your field. I mean, one of the first things we we did when, when we were working with um, the US, we lost thirty percent on a on an invoice, um, and the money was sent to the IRS. But it was our problem. We we lost we lost that money for two and a half years trying to get it back off the IRS. If I had a if I had a left off the phone and asked the guy a question, then I would have done it. But ask questions and look at experts or people that's done it before, and just just ask them. Men- mentors. What's what's the pitfalls here? Yeah, yeah. non executive directors. There's loads of people out there. Um, the university alumni uh, is very good for it as well. There's loads of people on there on the 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 internal web, uh, inf- intranet that 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 have put themselves up to be able to mentor people. Um, and they're they're brilliant. Loads of people. I get people asking me questions all the time, and I always give up my time. Um, 
always give up my time to help people because um the, the wheel always goes round. Like yeah, you, yeah. you always, you always, if you're, you're you're brave enough to ask people for your for your time, and then you're shutting somebody else down for asking your time. Yeah, yeah. Karma's a. Yeah. Oh yeah, karma will deal with that. Uh, Just on the final question, but before we finish up, did you business plan? Did you did you whenever you were setting up nice? Did you how how closely did you kind of look at the idea, research the market? Uh, you know. Projector sales, all that sort of stuff. Did you? Did I'm you not. I'm that? not a big. Uh, I'm not a big like sales guy. I'm not an accountant. Like I love numbers, but I'm not like forecasting an accountants and stuff. Like that. I put a lot of pressure, and I get my money's worth out of my account. Let me tell you, <laughs> she's probably listening. Um, the I, I at the start I didn't. Uh, I didn't business. I sort of business plan. Going through the local enterprise office in Donegal have been fundamentally unbelievable for us. Just advice, and again, the, the advice that we've gotten through the, the, the local enterprise office has been unbelievable then Kira went for the Ireland's best young entrepreneur that kind of took us on another level in, in, in relation to looking at other businesses and getting advice from other entrepreneurs but no it didn't at the start and you know what I don't really regret it because I learned a lot of mistakes yep. um, but I learned a lot as well you know what yeah, I mean yeah. um, now there's there's certain things that I, I regret um, and I learned from that and then I went and started asking questions and advice um, so that would be the biggest advice I would get ask questions and don't be afraid to ask people questions that maybe you don't want you, you don't want to hear the answer to yeah, um, yeah. to ask difficult questions and you know regardless of what it is take it on board oh, you know, because uh, they know better and it'll avoid you making probably an expensive mistake but you've got to have that mentality as well you've got to see this idea of egos and I know everything and all that if you if you're going into business a, a, an entrepreneur and you've got that a, a, a attitude you will fail yeah. And you will fail catastrophically. It's, yeah. it, it, it's it's just not set up. You've got to be open minded. You've got to understand your strengths, your weaknesses, and hire people to complement your weaknesses, not people that look like and talk like and, and are like you. You gotta you gotta hire the other type. Yeah. No, no. Listen, Gareth, we could we could go on for ages, but I really, really appreciate your time. So thanks very much for sitting down with us. That's been excellent. No worries. Cheers, Michael. Thanks, Dan. <laughs>